we will discuss in this um, last lecture several applications of what we have been doing, in particular of Poincare Hopf. Tomorrow, I'll give you an overview and a review of the whole subject, and then I'll give you a show also. First, about rotations in space. What does a rotation mean? Well, think of it this way, simply. A rigid body like this, it's terribly heavy. And then, you just put it in some other position. Okay? Without you moving the center of gravity. So, from this to this, that's a rotation. You might think of rotation as the following operation. You fix some axis, for example, vertical axis, and you do this. But it doesn't have to be that way. Rotation simply means take a rigid body, put it in another position, but without moving the center of gravity. Is that okay? Now, it is true that every rotation, as we have just defined, fixes an axis. That is, if you apply a rotation, there's an entire line passing through the origin that does not move. But that's not obvious. For example, if I rotate this thing around the vertical axis, it's like that. And if I rotate it along the horizontal axis like this, it's like this. Okay? So from this position, it came to this position. Is it clear that there was an axis around which I rotated? Well, it turns out that there's an axis like that, somewhere in between, around which I can rotate. But it is more of a theorem than an evidence. So, I shall begin by discussing the first application, which is very easy. Application 22. Every rotation in R3 and more generally, odd dimensional vector space, um, Euclidean space, fixes some axis. Yeah, so this is a whole line. Now, let's remark, in case you think that this is obvious, that rotation re looks like this, and you are spinning an object around something, that this statement is false. In even dimensional space. For example, Let's take the simplest non-trivial even dimensional space. That's R2. And the usual thing. Let's take the rotation of this, which, you know, spins the whole thing around and around. Like that. OK, there is something that is fixed. And that is the origin. Yes? But everything else in the plane is moved by the rotation. Everything moves. So the, this origin is not an axis. Axis means a whole line, a one-dimensional subset, is left fixed. So it's not true. In dimension two, a rotation fixes only one point. OK? Similarly, in all even dimensions, hi, good morning. Um, all in even dimensions, rotations don't necessarily fix anything, only the center of gravity of the object. But in odd dimensional spaces, a rotation always fixes an entire one dimensional subspace. That's quite remarkable. Now, various proofs of this fact exist. Um, one of them is essentially linear algebra. But um, Our proof 
is simply as follows. If you have such a rotation, imagine rotating, okay? Let's look at this rotation, but do it in slow motion. When you do it in slow motion, it induces a vector field, if you like, the derivative of this rotation. on the sphere which is inside the space. That is, on an even dimensional sphere, S even, which is in fact S odd minus one, which is inside our odd in question, so one dimension fewer, okay? And so we have a vector field, a dynamic system on this sphere, but we saw that when you have a dynamical system on a sphere, or in fact on any manifold, the behavior of that dynamical system is constrained by the topology of the manifold. So, um, in this case, <coughs> um, by the theorem 19 that we proved yesterday, that is, the Euler characteristic of this thing gives you a minimum number of fixed points that this vector field must have, the vector field we have must have at least how many fixed points? What's the other characteristic of S even? Two early in the morning and two fixed points. Okay, so two, let's say here and say here. But you see, if those two fixed uh, points are fixed, then the entire axis that connects those two, fixed, uh, two points must be fixed as well, because it's a rotation. It's a Euclidean motion. And then the axis joining them is also fixed. So you can see that in all dimensional spaces, a whole axis is fixed by every rotation. It's not true, as I emphasize, in even dimensional spaces. That's our first application. Okay. Second application. Um, let's um, discuss another field of mathematics or mathematical sciences, um, computer graphics. Now, we are not going to, of course, discuss in any detail any of the aspects, mathematical aspects of computer graphics, but there is an interesting operation um, that would be useful in such a field, which is this. Let's ask, can we design a continuous algorithm? I hope the intuitive meanings will become clear. Continuous algorithm, let's call it A, such that it assigns to each vector in R3, hmm? bless you, a non-zero um, vector, which we shall call AU, also in R3, which is perpendicular to U. What I mean is, you know, you have a vector like this, and then there's an algorithm from, that computes from this vector, a vector which is perpendicular to this. And if you are given a vector like this, there's an algorithm that computes a perpendicular vector like this, and if, once again, you have a vector like this, perhaps this algorithm is going to compute a vector like this, and so on, so on. Well, in R2, as you can see, it's perfectly possible and extremely easy. You just rotate the whole thing by 90 degrees. But in R3, if you think about it, there's an ambiguity. Let's say that this is the vector we're giving, and you say, rotate it by 90 degrees. Well, 90 degrees in which direction? This way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. I mean, there's a huge amount of ambiguity. 
you might say, well, rotate it in any direction. Ah, but that's not an algorithm. Algorithm means that the computer must be told exactly in which direction to rotate. Moreover, that direction, that algorithm, must be continuous, which means that if I take a slightly different vector, the result must be slightly different from the original vector, and so on. Is the position of the problem clear? OK. And such a thing, such an algorithm, will be useful in computer graphics, it turns out. Computer graphics. In R3. OK. For example, it would be useful in many areas. What do you think? Can we design such an algorithm? The answer is no. You cannot design such an algorithm, con continuous algorithm. Because, you see, if yes for contradiction, then the vector field A of U, which where U belongs to S2, would be a continuous vector field every a non-zero vector field on what is the unit sphere inside R3 on S2, which is exactly this. Yeah. In other words, on S2, you would have at this point, look at the radius vector, and I know that there is a, well, at the point hypothesis, there is a vector which is perpendicular to it, but this vector then is tangent to the sphere. Similarly, to such a radius vector, you might have a vector which is like this, so you should be able to define a non-zero, every non-zero vector field all over the sphere. But that, does such a thing exist? No, it doesn't exist. contradicting the same theory. Because every vector field on S2, on any manifold of non-zero order characteristic, you must have fixed points. In other words, you must have zeros of the vector field. OK. That's quite good. You might also like to um, look at the remark 20, which immediately follows. Okay, that was my second suggestion for application. Many other applications. Let's do a third application, which is a bit of a joke. Um, we shall consider a very theoretical meteorology. Do you know what meteorology means? It means the study science of weather. Yeah. Sunny, rainy, snowy, which doesn't often happen, and so on. Meteo, in French you say meteo for the um, English weather forecast. Yeah. Very theoretical meteorology. Um, Think of the wind that blows. Cape Town is famous for the wind, the strong gust of wind which is blowing from southeast and so on. And you ask yourself, well, here it's probably a windy day, it's blowing, and perhaps in Egypt, along the Nile, the wind is blowing. In Russia, across the Siberian plain, the wind is blowing. And maybe in Brazil, the wind is blowing along the beach and so on. And the, on the, in the middle of the ocean, some wind is blowing, and so on. Can it happen that all over the surface of the Earth, the wind is blowing? Mm. 
You know, if the surface of the Earth were not as we know it, but say, topologically, the torus, as we saw, it's easy to make the wind blow everywhere, right? If one day you have the wind pattern like this, then it would be the case that the, on the, everywhere on this torus, the wind, wind is blowing, right? On the surface of the Earth, can it happen that the wind is blowing everywhere? The answer is no, because the surface of the Earth, you see, ideally, in mathematical idealization, is essentially a two-dimensional sphere. So, this very theoretical meteorology says that at any moment, there must be a lull. Lull, L-U-L-L, -L, in English means a point where there is no wind, or state of no wind. There must exist some point on the surface of the Earth and we shall assume that this is homeomorphic test 2. In fact, it's not quite homeomorphic test 2 anyway, um, where the wind is not blowing, where there is no wind, excuse me. The existence of love. This statement is, of course, as I say, a bit of a joke, but it's anyway by no means obvious. So depending on the nature, the topology of the surface, Sometimes you can easily construct an everywhere, a non-zero wind field, if you like, but not on the surface of the Earth. So there are some problems with saying that the surface of the Earth is S2, but OK, please forgive us. Um, excuse me, why is that a problem? Hmm? Why is that a problem? Well, because you see, the, when we say the wind, we are always tacitly thinking horizontal wind, but you might because the atmosphere has finite thickness, you can have wind going up and down. And then you see, if you have a wind field which is like this, you can say, oh, here, there is wind because the air current is going up or coming down. But that means that you are no longer doing topology on the surface, on the two-dimensional surface. We are saying that if you have a vector field that's everywhere tangent to, say, S2, that vector field must have an equilibrium or zero, must vanish somewhere. But in fact, the atmosphere is not a two-dimensional S2. So there is a problem. But let's say that um, it's OK. The next application is very interesting. Oh, I hope it will interest many of us. But it is somewhat. Um, it requires a little bit of knowledge. So if you don't have any clue what I'm talking about, please just relax and sit back. But I'll try to explain what we do. It's an application to general relativity. We are now discussing, then, yet another field of science. You see what the wide range of applications topology can have, if only you exercise imagination and the flexibility of mind. So general relativity, as you know, a um, very famous theory. And you have probably heard of something called black holes. In popular literature, black hole is usually presented as a, something very, very massive, very heavy stuff, which has collapsed to perhaps a small region and which is so dense that it attracts everything from around the surrounding space and nothing can escape this uh, gravitational field and so on. That's probably the image of the black hole that we have. Well, in the actual mathematical formulation of general relativity, that's of course the physical picture we should have, but you can say it in another way. It turns out that in general relativity, what you do is this space-time. We have a space-time which is a manifold of dimension 4. And on this manifold, you define what is called a metric. In other words, a way of measuring, if you like, distance, angle, and so on. 
However, unlike in standard Euclidean or Riemannian geometry, this metric has a very peculiar feature. You know, when you discuss dot products of two vectors, a1, b1, c1, dot, a2, b2, c2, and in three-dimensional space, you multiply the components and add them, yes? In, that's the standard geometry, and we say that this metric is positive definite. Because if you calculate the square of any vector, you get something positive. Well, of course, you say. However, in relativity, for a certain interesting reason, you don't use a positive definite metric. If you take the dot product of two vectors, and now each vector has four components, the first three components, which represent space, they are multiplied together and added. A1, A2 plus B1, B2 plus C1, C2. But the last component, which represents time, are multiplied but subtract, subtracted, minus. And it turns out this is very important in order, to, in order to guarantee that the speed of light in vacuum is everywhere the same. It turns out. Interesting. Anyway, so in relativity, you use this funny metric, funny, if you like, dot or scalar product. Okay? And that's called uh, indefinite signature metric, and more specifically, Lorentzian metric. Okay? This is called Lorentzian. And in contrast, this is called Riemannian. OK. And moreover, in Lorentzian case, you can have coefficients in front that vary from space to space, point to point. So the metric becomes a function of time, a function of a point on the manifold. And that dependence on where you are in space time, you know, the metric might look different here from what it looks here and so on is the mathematical formulation of the fact that the space is curved. That's what it means for the space to be curved. That the metric is not constant. OK. So in general relativity, um, we have a Lorentzian metric. Usually denoted by G. Any metric is usually denoted by G. And so this is a 4 by 4. Um, symmetric matrix yeah, that varies um, of signature, or well, important thing is signature, not plus, but plus, 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 minus. Um, that depends, that varies, as, let's say, smoothly or continuously. from point to point. In some textbook treatments, the signature is not plus, 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 minus, but plus, minus, minus, minus. It doesn't matter which one you use. This one is slightly more pleasant geometrically, because you can think of the three-dimensional standard Riemannian manifold as a subset of this, by just looking at the first three components, and say, ah, but when we add time, you get the negative direction. But it doesn't matter which signature you use. We are going to use that signature. OK. And which is defined on a four-dimensional manifold over a four-dimensional manifold. And let's call it M, called space-time. That's the mathematical setup. Now, the claim is as follows. This metric, I said that the coefficients can be functions. In fact, are usually functions because the space is curved. And those functions are continuous functions, smooth functions. However, sometimes you, it might happen that some of those coefficients blow up. In other words, become infinity. Well, you don't want to have situations like that. Right? Or sometimes that those coefficients become um, so degenerate that this metric becomes degenerate. So it becomes zero. 
Well, you don't want to have situations like that either. It should be um, signature and non-degenerate matrix. But some things can happen. Those um, catastrophes, if you like, are called singularities. And that is the mathematical picture of what a black hole is. Singularities in the metric. Okay? Just as the metric varying from point to point, mathematically represents the curvedness of the space. So the singularity is something bad happening to this metric is exactly what the black holes are. Well, when I say exactly, I mean you should think of black holes that way. It's not quite exactly what black holes are. But anyway, the claim then is as follows. You cannot avoid singularities in some contexts. Suppose, for example, that the Euler characteristic of your space-time is not zero. Hmm? Then, for example, what's a good example? Suppose that the, your manifold is topologically S4. So maybe one in one model of cosmology, the space-time is a four-dimensional sphere. Who knows? In this case, an even dimension sphere has all the characteristic two, so it would certainly be non-zero. Okay. In such a case, then G must become singular. Somehow. And you can loosely I said exactly, but I take it back. But loosely think of these as black holes. Something goes wrong with the metric. Interesting, huh? So just from the topological hypothesis on the space-time, you can sometimes deduce that the metric cannot be regular everywhere. Yeah. Of course, for other choices of the space-time model, you might be able to define the Lorentzian, smooth Lorentzian metric everywhere, but not always, not on all manifolds, not on all models. Here is the proof, which I shall write over there. Let's argue by contradiction. Suppose that G has no singularity. Then you can draw the following picture at each point in space-time. At this point in space-time, there is a direction which we shall call space direction. And although I'm drawing something that looks like 2D, this is a three-dimensional space. Okay? I cannot draw that picture, so I'm going to represent this three-dimensional uh, spatial direction by a plane. And then there is a direction, which is the time direction. Yeah, and that's 1D, one-dimensional, space-time. And you might know that the light propagates at constant speed in vacuum everywhere. So there is what is called the light cone. What this means is that any existence, any world line must fit inside this light cone. Because if I have a curve which is going outside this light cone, which that means that for the, some unit of time, I have traveled faster than what this 45 degree angle represents, which is the speed of light. You cannot exceed the speed of light anywhere, so at least in vacuum. So that's the light cone. OK, so at each point, there exists some sort of object like this, which is called light cone. OK? Now, it turns out that once you have a light cone, so please imagine that this is a three-dimensional di direction, but there's a one-dimensional di direction along time. It turns out to be easy to average over the light cone and define the average direction of time. What I mean is, well, the you know, time axis might be pointing this way, pointing this way, pointing this way, but you can average over. That's actually a very easy operation. So in this scenario, this part of the light cone corresponds to the future. This part corresponds to the past. And that's the present. That's where you are. That's when you are. Okay? And all the events in the past 
might propagate and reach you, so those are the influences. But if something happened in the past but very, very far away, then it still hasn't had time to reach you because it can propagate at most at the speed of light, so it hasn't affected you. For example, if the sun, our sun, explodes at this very moment, we will not know that anything happened for about eight minutes because the sun is eight light minutes away. There is no way that the explosion of the sun will affect us. It's not true that as soon as the sun explodes, we get boom like this. Because even that kind of shock wave cannot travel faster than the speed of light. No information travels faster than the speed of light. Not even the information that, ah, the, there is a, a star exploding. Okay? So there is a finite limit to the speed at which information propagates. Therefore, the only influence on you that can come that can affect you is here, and the only events that you can affect in the future are here, and so on. But anyway, that's future and past light cones. So, if G has no singularity, let's go back. Then, as I have just drawn, at every point on the manifold, we can draw this um, space time diagram, uh, this uh, light cone diagram. And in particular, we can draw a vector tangent to the space-time so that um, V of x, non-zero, points or is directed along the average future direction. Here, you might want to imagine you know, I don't know which way it is. Maybe like this, V of x. And you can do this in a continuous fashion from point to point. Um, OK. But um, theorem 19 again, which says that the number of fixed points or number of equilibria of a vector field on a manifold is bounded below by the order characteristic. And if the order characteristic is non-zero, that means that there must be an equilibrium. So by theorem 19, forces V to be zero somewhere on M, which contradicts that statement. Thus, we have even an application of topology to general relativity to cosmological questions. It is a baby application, but there are many deeper and, and more exciting applications to all areas of physics. Okay, any questions about those one, two, three, four applications that we have discussed of Poincare Hopf? No? <coughs> In that case, this is the end of chapter five, and it is the end of the main material that I wanted to present to you and share with you in this course. I'd like to conclude then the main part of the course, of the lecture course, by giving you a little appendix. You know, when you go have a dinner, at Ames and elsewhere, it's nice if there's a dessert after the meal. So this is something like a dessert. An appendix for dessert. You have all heard of the fundamental theorem of algebra. Yes? That a polynomial with com complex coefficients, for example, must have a root somewhere, provided you are looking for a root among the complex numbers. Yeah. You may not have a real root, 
but it always has a complex root. And once you know that, it's very easy to prove that, in fact, by Euclidean algorithm and so on, if the polynomial has degree d, then there are d roots. Some of these roots might be uh, multiple, but anyway, d roots, when you count the multiplicities properly, you all know this. Does everyone know how to prove it? You might have seen a proof. There are many different ways of proving it. And the most standard proof nowadays in an undergraduate curriculum uses complex analysis, something called the Liouville's theorem. Very nice argument, which says that a holomorphic function, which is um, bounded everywhere on the complex plane, must be constant. But anyway, so there are many proofs. But I'd like to give you a topological proof of the fundamental theorem algebra.